And now it's time for Southern California Sports Fishing Voice. Let's talk hookup. For the next two hours, join Pete Gray, Rock Cod Rick Maxa, Corey Sandin, and this week's special expert guest for fishing information, new techniques to catch more fish, and the most current scoop on what's happening in the water. Let's Talk Hookup is sponsored in part by Royal Polaris, the world's finest long-range sports fisher. By Ford, the official truck of Let's Talk Hookup and Shimano Rods and Reels. Fish with the best, Shimano. Get ready for the fastest two hours on radio with the hosts of Let's Talk Hookup, Pete Gray, Rock Cod Rick Maxa, and Corey Sandin. Good morning, anglers, and welcome to Let's Talk Hookup, man. Do we have a great show for you today? Pete is starting our Cat My Adventure up north in Alaska. Going to be a great trip for him, and man, Corey and I are standing by with what is going to be a very, very fun and informative show. A great buddy of Let's Talk Hookup, Mike Shane from Hub Sea World Research Institute. We're going to be talking all kinds of great info, sea bass and hatchery and halibut and calicos and the whole nine. It's going to be a lot of fun with one of our, uh, I mean, just a, a guy that really knows a whole lot about it's going to be a lot of fun. You stay tuned. You're having a Let's Talk Hookup with Mike. It's Let's Talk Hookup on Southern California Sport Fishing Voice, the Mightier 1090 ESPN Radio. The name that stands out among anglers is Fisherman's Landing, your top choice in local and long-range fishing. Hi, this is Doug Kern. Our hardworking crew will make sure your fishing experience is one to remember. We offer the finest open party trips from one to three days, the best charter boats available, and of course, our world-renowned long-range fleet is second to none. Fisherman's Landing is a full-service operation offering great half-day trips on the Dolphin and full-day open party trips on the spacious and comfortable Liberty. Since we introduced the full-day trips at Fisherman's Landing, the 85-foot Liberty has become a favorite among full-day operations with bunks for your comfort, huge bait capacity, and RSW fish holds to keep your catch fresh. Plus, Liberty has a big modern galley and two interior heads with showers. All our open party trips from half-day, full, or one- to three-day trips can easily be booked online at Fisherman'sLanding.com or give us a call at 619-221-8500. I'll see you at Fisherman's Landing in San Diego. This is Bob Hoots at Costa Sunglasses. Visual signs are a critical part of my fishing program, from bay bass to bluefin. I wear Costas to see what's out there. Costas are built with advanced polarization technology with our 580 lens, designed to cut through the sun's glare while providing enhanced color to see more fish. Costa was founded by a group of anglers wanting a high-performance lens for every fishing application. Costa has a West Coast-style frame and lens for your adventures. CostaSunglasses.com. Hookup! All right, welcome back to Let's Talk Hookup. And Rick, this is one of those shows I always dive deep into, man. All the information and yeah, cool. always fun having uh, having Mike Shane from Hub Sea World in here. And uh, man, not not anybody that's got better info than what's going on than Mike. Mike, good morning. Stoked to have you back. Good morning. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate the opportunity to come in here and uh, talk to you and your listeners about uh, what's going on with our organization and our programs. Well, well we're stoked to have you too, and especially <clears throat> this time of year, like. It's summertime and, you know, bluefin and offshore and everything is happening. But, boy, it's it's the busy time for you guys at Hubs, too. Like, this is when kind of everything in your program is happening at once. I mean, you guys are year-round on the fish, but but you, you get it from all angles right now. Yep, all angles. Some, uh, you know, summertime is, is our busy time, and we're obviously, with regards to the hatchery and producing white sea bass, this is go time for us. I mean, we're setting eggs right now and got a lot of little babies running around there with the goal of, you know, getting those fish into grow-out pens later this fall and then eventually releasing them next year. So really the production run sets us up for success uh, for the following year that's going on right now. We're also, um, and talk more about this, but the head collection efforts trying to, you know, continue research on what's going on out there, looking at the genetics of our fish uh, and, and tags, et cetera, trying to understand that. So we're we're scrambling, running around, getting heads from different landings, uh, markets, et cetera. So that's, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going. You're jumping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had a lot of fun talking, and it was, I believe it was earlier in the year, maybe towards the latter part of last, but um, there was a, a – I don't know. Revelation is the right word, but in, in terms of head collection, um, you know, there was there was talk about how the percentages were lower because only X amount of heads scanned had the tag. But then, through genetic research, found out that basically that the program was 
as successful as we all knew it was that the outside, you know, just from looking at the raw data points, it maybe, you know, there was only X amount of, you know, return. But then through genetics research, you realize, like, this, this program contributes an incredible amount to our fishery. Yeah, so so let me just give an update on that and what's happening to the to your listeners and you guys. But so um, back in the before the start of COVID, we had decided to you know we had the same kind of questions. You know, we obviously getting their tag return rates that we were seeing. You know, one in every about 300 heads that we would scan had a tag in it. But we suspected you know I don't know maybe fish were losing the tags. Other things may have happened, and so we uh, worked with some collaborators in South Carolina who who do this uh, who, uh, as long as we've been doing en- enhancement work, and they're genetics experts and have labs yeah. designed for this. So we provided samples to them of all our brood stock so they could basically fingerprint and know all our fish that we've had uh, since 1995, at least in the hatchery in Carlsbad. Once they had that information, uh, we provided them the otoliths or the stones, uh, that the pearls, you know, in the head that they can use to actually, their bones, are, but they actually were able to pull genetics off of the, or genetic material off of those otoliths by soaking them in a solution. So they randomly picked a bunch of otoliths that we had already saved. Um, most of them were, or all of those were juvenile fish that came from our, my own field sampling over the years. So out of those juvenile fish, you know, we, we knew that about 7% of those had tags in them so Mm -hmm. but they were blind to that they didn't know they came back after doing the initial analysis and said it's more like four times that amount so they found (laughs) about 28 percent however you know subsequently you know this was a master's thesis student's work and so there's been some review independent reviews looking at it we're trying to work on a publishing a paper and trying to refine those numbers so you know uh, maybe coming down a little bit but as we work through some of the you know details of that um and we're continuing to do that work. So now we have uh, just received some federal funding. We're now we're going to look at the adults now, those yeah. are juvenile fish. So now let's see if that same sort of trend holds in the in the wild in the adult fish. So we've been saving more heads the last few years. Started last year, we saved all those heads. Are currently still sitting in the freezer because what we plan to do now is a multi pronged approach, not just looking at the genetics, but we're going to see if they come back and tell us, hey, this head was tagged. We, and we didn't detect it, what, what's going on. Right. Just genetically, they identified it. This was a hatchery fish. So we can then take that head, and then we're going to plan to X-ray that head and look to see, well, can we see yeah, can did, see the small tag in the head? We're going to look to see if we can see it in there. And then kind did of the tag move? Did, exactly. the, did just yeah. the natural you know, the body, when it's trying to you know, heal itself, did it push it out? I mean, yeah. you know, we've all yeah. had a splinter or a fish spine, and we push it out. You know I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. There's so many things. Now, will genetics tell if a... You know, if a if a hubs hatchery born female fish, um, which has a tag, but then spawns offspring in the in the wild, um, and then that fish grows up and gets caught, will genetics tell us if that fish was related to the to the hatchery? Yeah, fortunately not. We've okay. Many of those discussions, we ask that, and we know that the fish that we're releasing are obviously reaching sexual maturity. We know they're spawning out there, but unfortunately, the genetics gets a little bit too complicated sure. to be able to look at what you call F twos or F threes, you know, future generations. Yeah. So look at that. The other thing, just to mention quickly, that we were um, doing with those this fish is otolith is also to just kind of corroborate the genetic results is you can take those otolith stones and we're collaborating with some folks down in mexico that can take uh, a, a chemical look at the chemical composition right in the core or the center of the otolith and look at the what they call the stable isotope ratios for oxygen pretty much carbon and detect a hatchery reared fish that way because Come you know on. obviously they're spending the first four months or so if, if in the hatchery eating diets that we provide them from oh, manufacturers. Oh, okay. Different than a wild fish would eat. So they that creates a different chemical composition. So we can then look at use those results in addition to yeah. the genetics to say, you know, if there's some any questions with the genetics, we can go, well, here's what the isotope kind of showed us. And, we're you know, we're just, so right now we're currently working to develop and make those tech, the uh, chemical composition, isotope uh how More cool. robust. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so the yeah. isotopes. I mean, just to help understand, are like tree rings. Like you can you can look at the tree rings and see what the diet was in the earlier rings. Like would be on a tree. Yeah. So it's not. Yeah. And, uh, for what we're focusing on, we're focusing like on that first. I mean, we can take a sample small enough yeah. in the first three four months of their life. 
So even two months, I think we're going to get it down to two months. Wow. So that means you've got to get right in the center of that core, take a small center section that's about one or two millimeters in length out of that and, and then create that and run it through that's machines awesome. that Amazing. show you the, the, especially the carbon ratio. That's what seems to be the different okay. part of that. Yeah. And so you get a cloud of points on the data basically on a carbon scale and say, here, here's a cloud of points from hatchery fish are different from the cloud of points that are, um, Wild fish. So then you can go. Okay, yeah, this is their difference. And that's and awesome. It's a true yeah. fingerprint. I mean, you, yeah. you can yeah. you can read that yeah. definitively. Yeah, a little more effort, more time. And sure. Just scan it for a tag, <laughs> yeah. but uh, and costs obviously. But yes. Well, that's great. And I, I think we were just really excited to hear. I mean, we I think we all know. I, I'm a huge believer in the program. I know how much good it does. There is no there is no denying that you know millions of fish put back into our fishery makes a huge difference for it. And and I know that there's plenty of other factors there, too, that we've got good environmental conditions. We've got no gill nets on the beach. I mean, I, I know that everything adds to it, but I also know that this is a fantastic program that works really hard and puts a lot of fish back into the water for us. Yeah, and it's it's unique in the sense of the uh, how how the program operates and the and the various volunteers and the people involved with the program. I mean, nowhere to our knowledge around the world is it involved such a a large cooperative effort to do this. It's not just us, Hub Zero Research, doing this, but it's a collaboration also with CCA, uh, the Coastal Conservation Association, and and all these volunteers that are helping us release fish at a larger size, getting you know to hopefully to get over through some bottleneck of of, of recruiting. Recruitment and, and and getting larger fish out there to hopefully reach the fishery and, and survive better. So, it's it's really you know a, a great partnership amongst all the all the people and organizations to do this. Where you know you talk about most stock enhancement programs around the country even are just releasing fish you know at maybe a month, two months in age and putting them out there. And it's usually their departments of natural resources or fish and wildlife right. folks that are doing those. Efforts there. California is different where we've been the sole contractor to the Department of Fish and Wildlife to operate this program for 35 years or since the inception of the program. So it's been fun getting to watch the program evolve too. You know, like we're, we're just part of the public, but we all feel like we're involved. You know, whether you're in an angling club or you see the grow out pen or you donate a, a head to it. And even though, you know, I don't have anything directly to do with it, I, I still feel like we're part of it. We get to hear, you know, we get to hear from you on the, on the radio show on the weekends and about how it is and, and how it's evolved and, you know, and because things have changed because there wasn't always grow out pens and there wasn't always like you guys are just always adaptive to make the program the best it could possibly be. It's it's very fun to watch. Yeah, thank you. So it's, yeah, definitely, you know, it's not a cookbook process yet, even we've been doing this for 30 some odd years. I can't just say, here, here's what you do to go grow sea bass and, and create a, uh, an effective hans- enhancement program. We do have, you know, ideas and we do have, and we have created a roadmap for success and we just need to, okay, fig- get the funding and get some goals and some things uh, set up to say, okay, well, we know how to do this at least now that we can, you know, given some direction and goals from the department and the science advisory committee, you know, how can we make this program a uh, even greater success? What's the what's the life cycle like for you guys creating a, a hatchery raised sea bass? I mean, uh, we we always hear you talk about the brood stock, but like, what's the cycle like? When does it happen, and how long, and when do they go to the pens and release and all that? Like, what's the what's the start to finish like for one that gets kicked out the door? Yeah, it's very it's very intensive, especially the first month. You know, so right now, you know, we've got eggs that you know when when, when when the, when the spawn occurs, you know, we'll look at that quality of that spawn. Is it a good spawn to set up? Um, and, you know, what's the viability that is? How good, a, you know, what, what looks like the amount are fertilized, et cetera. Those eggs then, okay, this is go time, and we'll use this spawn. And we know based on genetics uh, possibly how many fish females may have contributed to that spawn. So we'll set up a number of eggs, you know, for example, if one female contributed a certain amount of eggs versus we just had a spawn yesterday that we set up that four meal four females contributed to it. So that's a huge spawn for us. And so we set those eggs up in, in tanks according to, you know, 50 eggs per liter or, or uh, in the water. And so uh, how many, depending on how many liters are in the tank, those eggs gently go through the water and roil around, move around. And so after about two days, they start hatching. So that's considered day zero right there, okay. two days later. So they start hatching out about, about a day or a couple days later. Then we start adding uh, live feeds. And live feeds for us are sea monkeys or our oh, no our, artemia. So that's what we feed them. <coughs> Enriched artemia, they get, you know, artemia like any invertebrate goes through various stages of development. So we feed them what's called the first or second instar, the artemias. And so for the first at least three weeks, they're getting this artemia. 
and that's enriched with uh, nutrients. And we feed them throughout the day, different, you know, uh, add them a couple, three, four times a day. This food goes in there to keep them getting good diets. At about three weeks, two weeks, we start to then to try to wean them onto uh, what's called dry pellets or feed, you know, mm-hmm. and it's mi- they're micro diets. So they have feed now. The technology has improved in this area greatly that. These small, looks like salt and pepper flakes. I was going to say, because this yeah. thing is hatched yeah. days or weeks <laughs> yeah. ago. I mean, it can't yeah. be. Yeah, their mouths aren't very big. To... So, yeah. So, That's yeah, cool. Basically, so, and then from there, once we've got them weaned, you know, it's kind of game over. That yeah. usually happens by the end of the first month. And then the the food size and the pellets just get bigger and bigger as they grow. So. Now, are they still in the same pen with their, um, uh, you know, tank? Or I don't know how it yeah. works with the with the big fish that, that, that spawn them? Uh, no, no, we don't put them in there. I mean, they're, they go, they come into separate tanks. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we have separate larval rearing tanks. Okay. They spend those tanks. They spend about the first thirty to fifty days in, roughly, before we then move them out of those tanks because they're growing and, and the tanks, you know, are getting too small for them. I mean, uh, so we move them over into bigger tanks um, where they then can get even bigger and they yeah. get to the three inch size, roughly, inside the hatchery in those tanks. At that point, once they reach about three to four inches in size, we can then tag them. Actually, yeah, they're about that size, about 90 days. So you're placing a tag in a fish that's only three inches long. Yeah, exactly. Wild. And 90 days right there. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. So we're tagging all those, and then they go from there. They leave the indoor comfort of of the hatchery and go outside into our outdoor tanks, which are flow through seawater in those tanks. Everything on the inside of the hatchery is what we call recirculating aquaculture. So we're controlling. It makes it easier for us to control the temperature and the lighting in the tank and, sure. and that kind of stuff, make it ideal for them. So it's the Goldilocks uh, time inside, yeah. the, uh, <laughs> inside the hatchery. So is that happening at the Hub SeaWorld area, or is yeah. that at the Carlsbad? That's or both. Carlsbad. So Carlsbad. I mean, we do we do uh, uh, that work as well or can do other. We're working on yellowtail and halibut. At, at the Mission Bay facility, but we, you know one of the crops that we're working on right now, we actually did start at Mission Bay in January and then transferred those fish up to Carlsbad when they were uh, about 50 days old, 60 days old. So, and just to, for resource purposes, we had to run, uh, do that down there. It was, that was that was a setup on January where those fish spawned on Super Bowl Sunday. So, uh, getting excited for the game, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, so. Uh, yeah, so, uh, again, they, they after they're tagged, then they go outside, and they spend another couple of weeks in there. We're just checking tag retention, and then they get, before they leave to the grow out sites, they get a health inspection by the department's pathologist, looks at them, gives us blessing, and then we can deliver them to the various grow out sites, and that'll usually in the fall, October, November time frame, get them set up for the winter grow out. That's what awesome. A, what amazing work, I know. It's right? so cool, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's such a huge contribution to everything we love, right? Totally. I mean, it's everything we love. It- Sea bass and, and and you guys always have us anglers, ang, you know, as you know, we're, we're part of it, you know, uh, whether it be drop off of heads, whether it be, you know, fundraising, whether it be contributing broodstock. I mean, you you guys do such a good job of involving the angling public and never afraid to ask for help. Hey, we're we're trying to we're trying to get some halibut, we're trying to get some sea bass, we're trying to we you know we need more heads, whatever it might be. I I think that's one of the things that I I like so much about the program is you know it's always transparent. It's always for us, and it's always like including the England community to go along with it. Yeah, I mean, just going thinking about you know how many times since the 30, 35 years we've been doing this program, well, the angling community that and sports fishermen in particular that we've relied on to support and help us with this program, whether it is actually out there collecting fish, saving heads for us, running them, driving them down, you know, their the grow out sites, and you know, CCA providing the insurance for those grow out sites. And including even, you know, legislation when things need to occur politically. And totally. It's been this, the sport, the, the recreational side, helping to drive that process. In addition to, obviously, raising the funds for this, because when you fish in the ocean, your ocean enhancement stamp is what it goes to the department. They manage those funds, and that's what we get money from to operate this program. That's awesome. So, I love it. Man, just going to be such a great show, Corey. I know you know the same. Like, just there's... Th- it's just a different level of information with a guy like Mike Shane here. I can't wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. I get geeked out on yeah, it, honestly, totally. right? And so, Mike, you have a, a gala coming up September 21st. Yeah, so this is our 60th year. You're our founding fathers wow. who uh, 60 years. started us the year before they uh, while they were building the park. So the year before SeaWorld opened, 
Um, they built our organization with, you know, the mission to return to the sea some measure of the benefits derived from it. And that's always been us moving forward. And we specialize in that and do that sort of research in about five different core areas in our, in our, in our pro, in our organization. Sorry. And you just, we've just been talking about the sea bass, which is our sustainable seafood comes under the umbrella of our sustainable seafood program. But, you know, we also focus in areas of wildlife populations, ocean health. Um, animal behavior, which is kind of acoustics and sound in the water. So, you know, we, we do a lot of research on all these areas. And so for 60 years, um, you know, we've been doing this work. And so it's time to celebrate this year. Our 60th anniversary will be held uh, at Gala on September 21st. It'll be in the park at SeaWorld. How cool. Um, That's so awesome. So you could go to the park, or sorry, go to our website and um, Support and come to the event by uh, buying some tickets and supporting our organization that evening. And, that, and how much are the tickets? The tickets, I believe, are around $150. Uh, roughly, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, so, yeah. and that'll, there'll be animals and all this stuff included. But Let here's me, the cool part we're giving away two tickets today, yeah, right? Man, no so, doubt. two yeah, of those yeah. tickets are going to <laughs> one lucky caller or texter to that gala September 21st held at uh, actual SeaWorld in the yeah, park. Yeah. And let me throw one in, yeah. too. Nobody puts on a show like you guys do at Hubs in SeaWorld. I mean, it's a it's a very cool event. Uh, you, have, you, you know how I know? Because Rick and Dallas are going, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. So if you want to come and be a part of it and be, uh, you know, be a lucky caller. Or yeah, totally. Today, come join us. It's all yours. And uh, telephone number is 213-432-1090. Or you can text us via the... Uh, Via the app, only through the app. It's it's done through there. Make sure you leave your name and your telephone number, a way to contact you. If you are the lucky winner, uh, we're going to have Mike at the end of the show flip a coin. All this cool information, Rick, I can't wait for the fish reports, man. The tuna fishing. It's I, happening. Dude, I even saw, <laughs> I saw a grotto in the county, too, man. we got some fun fish reports. Mike, Shane, all this cool information. We're going to be right back on the Let's Talk Hookup app, the Mightier 1090 ESPN Radio. Are you passionate about fishing and the great outdoors, but not quite sure where to go? Look no further than Queen Charlotte Safaris in pristine British Columbia, Canada. Hello, this is Valerie Holbridge. There's so many reasons to join us on your next fishing adventure. A few of the highlights are fishing in protected, calm waters. Very important. Quality Chinook salmon run all season long. After you've caught your salmon, we're going to go out for the great Pacific halibut, lean cod, rockfish, and dungeness crab. Our beautiful lodge overlooks Shingle Bay and Sandspit, and it's so easy to get to. Fly from almost any airport into Vancouver and then on to Sandspit. Fish processing, your fishing license, your gear, all included. Just bring that fishing arm and that smile. Let our chef pamper you with amazing meals while our staff gives you wonderful hospitality, all included in your Queen Charlotte Safari's package. Give me a call on our toll-free number, 1-877-815-2892, or go to our website, qcsafaris.com. For quality, the Islander out of Fisherman's Landing is a favorite among anglers. But Islander Charters is much more than great fishing. The quality of the captains and crew, as well as the great meals and service, speak for themselves. Comfortable staterooms, a super clean and well taken care of boat, are just a few of the reasons the Islander is so popular. The Islander specializes in one and a half to five day fishing. Experience the Islander difference. Visit islandersportfishing.com. There are plenty of boat slips and marinas in San Diego, but there's only one Kona Kai. It's not just a place to park your boat. It's a way of life here in America's finest city. The Kona Kai Resort Spa and Marina has multiple swimming pools and a private beach, waterfront restaurants, and award-winning spa, most of which is included for marina tenants. Check ResortKonaKai.com for more information. The Kona Kai Resort, much more than just a place to park your boat. The lighter the bite and the cleaner the water means one thing. We need a thinner leader for more natural presentations. That's where Seaguar Gold Label Leader Material shines. It's Seaguar's thinnest leader material yet. That means it's even less visible underwater and creates more natural presentations for better catch rates on leader-shy fish. With exceptional knot and tinsel strength, this advanced leader material is now available from 2-pound test for fishing trout in the Sierra to 80-pound test for big yellowfin in Guadalupe. Get Seaguar Gold Label at your favorite tackle dealer or learn more at Seaguar.com. All right, good morning, and welcome back to Let's Talk Hookup. And, man, that intro, Rick, and all that information, and, and just having Mike Shane in studio is so just 
uh, no other way to say it. it's badass. Yeah, you totally. know, all the cool information. And <laughs> totally. I love it. I really do. And 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 I know he's got some good information. Maybe on on kelp health and calicos. Even you know something I love doing. And I, I you guys I know have done a lot of work on uh, on other fish too, particularly yellowtail and sea bass. And halibut. you know we we got to do a uh, uh, yeah yeah halibut. We we got to do a tour one time um, at the uh, Mission Bay facility and saw you know tanks with big yellows and halibut and things like that. So um, is there is that just for research sake? Is there is there plans for doing the same thing with sea bass for other species down the line, whatever they may be? Um, is it just for you know for knowledge for the back pocket? Like I mean, I know you guys do a lot. Of, you do a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. So to focus on the halibut initially, so California halibut back when this or, or ocean resources enhancement program got started in the mid '80s was actually a fish that was under under the program, and so we were culturing those fish. Okay. Um, There's another organization involved up in LA, and they had the brood stock, and so we it was and we did some some very small releases back then, and then over the years the funding just you know there wasn't enough funding to do both species, so we mm-hmm. just continued to focus on white sea bass, and then along the way it kind of got lost over time with regards to uh, different changing people in the department, you know, not keeping up with what the history of the program. So myself and a couple others of, at the Institute, you know, obviously been around since the inception of this program, kind of had to remind them, look, you know, halibut. And so we've got private funding in the last few years to look at California halibut again and are trying to currently investigate um, a couple of tackle a couple of different problems with those, and one being you know just uh, their uh, their sexual selection and sense that you can in through c- culture work you can actually based on the temperature if it 's not right again there 's a Goldilocks thing just, just right uh, at the right time of their age, you can convert them to uh, males get out of really yeah. really halibut yes really yeah so so we 're trying to figure out what that sweet spot uh-huh. is so that when we culture them you know we can make sure that we 're trying to get at least a fifty fifty ratio getting females out there. And that's important because, as we know about climate change and and the oceans are warming up, and this year looks like we've got an El Nino coming, but if, as oceans continue to warm, obviously we know that we you know, halibut will convert to males if it's too warm. It just in, in the wild, we halibut may disappear because there's just no females left to reproduce. So that's Crazy. huge implications for us and the research that we're doing on halibut. So we're working on that, and as well as kind of making sure we can get the correct colors on the fish. I mean, they can be albinos in the culture and this and that, but you obviously need them dark on the eye side and white on the on the blind side. So we're working on that on that kind of, kind of stuff. And so we have done as a as a couple of years ago, even did a few small pilot scale releases on these halibut in in Mission Bay, and had permission from the department to do that. And then when we kind of continue wanted to continue doing more releases, they kind of told us time out and and said we we want this to kind of come back under the ORHAP program, which is going to require dedicated funding for that, too. I mean, so we're still continuing to do the research on halibut, but with the intent that if they give us the green light yeah. at some point, we get funding, we're ready to go. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You're and not then, starting over from yeah, scratch yet. Yeah, yeah. So, this is so cool. I yeah, would love yeah. to see, like, the $60 we spend on our annual uh, fishing license, more than $3, $3.15 of that go to, because, I mean, currently, I mean, I, I'll i stand on the stoke box for just a, a second, but I know that the, our fishing license money, other than that ocean enhancement, goes to the general fund of the state, right? I mean, I, I hate to get political, but I know that f- for years, and, and it's just uh, going to potholes and going to the governor <laughs> to do his uh, agenda is kind of... Yeah, I mean, we Sad. do. We don't get 100% of those funds. I mean, your ocean enhancement stamp now is up to six, six, I think. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I was going to pull my license and look at it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so they, they do take their administrative fees and other things. And they're yeah. actually supporting a couple positions at, at the department through this funding as well, uh, like the administrator and I think part of the pathologist time so are, are covered under there. But um, it seems to be more of that money is being shifted over to the department. And we've actually been getting... Uh, some supplemental funding uh, from um, oh, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the the Sports Fishing Restoration Act SFRA funds okay. um, that help to support this, but all, all in the right yeah, direction. So, totally, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that's good. Well, speaking so. of the direction, we're going to go in the direction of north by a whole oh. long way. <clears throat> we got, <clears throat> pardon me, we got Pete on the line right now, starting off our big Cat Mai adventure with Cat Mai Lodge. Good morning, Pete. Good morning, Pete. Hey, good morning. Uh, 
Corey, Rick, and Mike, it sounds like a great show and lots of good information there, Mike. Sure appreciate your time and all your efforts of what you're doing. And I and, uh, appreciate you guys being there so I can uh, start this Cat My Adventure, which we're uh, doing today. I flew up to Anchorage. I'm in Anchorage right now. Uh, it's cloudy and looking like rain. But <laughs> surprise, surprise. Welcome to Alaska, shock. right? Yeah, what we a don't like the weather. Wait a minute. <laughs> but we're looking actually this week looking pretty good for the weather. So uh, knock on wood, you can't predict the weather here in Alaska. But uh, uh, it looks a little dicey today getting into the lodge. We may have to fly into King Salmon. Uh, and then what happens is Bob comes and picks us up in the float plane. And then we transfer everybody from King Salmon, which is only like a 20-minute flight on the mm-hmm. float plane, over to the lodge. Uh, what happens at the lodge is the uh, uh, gravel runway gets a little soggy if it rains, and they don't want to chance these uh, 16 passenger twin uh, prop uh, uh, planes, uh, you know, sinking into the mud or, or something like that. So, if there's any question whatsoever, we'll go to the King Salmon, but we won't know that till about 9:30 this morning when we uh, when we start heading over there to the lodge. But uh, I just uh, we had a great flight up um, yesterday. Oh my gosh, with this high pressure, the California coast and and the Oregon and Washington coast were just absolutely crystal clear and beautiful so nice flight up but most of what i wanted to do this morning other than thank you guys for being there was throw out a huge get well soon to our good buddy gus from burbank gus klein he's in the hospital with a respiratory infection and uh we're thinking of you gus and we really want you to get well so you can get to that queen charlotte safaris trip which is our next trip that Corey and i are doing oh, but yeah, uh gus. gus is uh, gus is under the weather and uh He's a tough guy though, but he'll he'll come back strong. But uh, we we're, it was tough to hear that Gus was in the hospital, but he's going to come back strong. No doubt, man. Gus, we need you back on this one. Get well soon, buddy. Yeah, for sure. But uh, hey, I'll report back to you guys uh, next Saturday. We fly back to Anchorage next Saturday, and um, I'll probably uh, use the sat phone from the lodge uh, before we leave to to, for, to Anchorage and give you the full rundown. I guess the sockeye are thick right now. The run is fantastic this year, so I know this afternoon we'll be we'll be uh, getting a bunch of sockeye, and then the kings are in, and uh, and then uh, t- probably toward the end of the week the uh, Chum salmon will be in, and then, of course, uh, those big, giant Alaskan trout that I want to go pursue. Hopefully, those will be cooperating, too. But uh, <laughs> we'll give you the report. We'll give you the report next week, and uh, you guys have a great weekend of shows, and uh, great week, and thanks again, Mike, for all you do for us. Great. Thank you. We right. appreciate it. Steer clear of the brown bears up there, buddy. Oh, yeah. No, that's part of the fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pete, have a great trip. We'll look forward to the report next Saturday. All right. Thanks very much. Get well, Gus. Yeah, you feel better, Gus. That's awesome. We'll have a great trip. Look forward to hearing that. And, man, phones are packed up. Texts are rolling through, too. Corey, let's jump into the phones. Yeah, for sure, Rick. And how about Matt? Matt Cohn from La Mesa. Good morning, Matt. Hey, Matt. Thanks for getting us started. Hey, good morning, guys. I was just calling in with a fish report. Uh, Got out on the Pacific Dawn this week on a day and a half with Mike and all of his awesome crew. And uh, thanks to... My new outfit that I picked up from you, Ricky, I got a 71 and a half pound bluefin on the knife jig. And hey. then um, on the uh, Therese rail rod with the TAC-20, um, thanks to Brandon in the tackle store with the Mustad Rip Roller 400 gram jig, I picked up a new personal best of 132.4 pound bluefin tuna. Wow. wow! Congratulations, Matt. There's a there's a solid limit—a seventy a seventy pounder and a hundred and thirty pounder. Right. Yeah. So I'm getting those processed and I'm uh, pick them up today. And um, I was hoping to uh, be on the leaderboard here of the Western Outdoor News Big Fish Challenge, but I've already been kicked to the curb by Shane. Uh, he got a <laughs> one fifty one on the tomahawk but that's how fishing goes so there's the incentive to get out there and uh, maybe get another one here matt congratulations you'll have to share with us what was the what was the hot jig for you on your big fish or do you uh, have to wait the, until after the tournament uh, to tell us well that was a 400 gram rip roller um knife jig Awesome. And I was actually lucky to get the fish because when they put the gaffs in the fish and brought it over the rail, the jig fell out of the fish oh. and the hook stayed in the fish. So somehow the fish worked the uh, split ring off the jig and completely bent up the bottom of the jig. 
Um, but, you know, hey, fish on board, no harm, no foul. That's so wow. rad. Well, congratulations, buddy. That's an awesome fish and a stellar limit. I'm glad you had a good time in the Pacific Dawn and uh, the tackle worked so well. Appreciate the phone call, Matt. Thanks very much. Good Nice going. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool report for sure. Hey, we got the cast man on hold. It's brought to us by Dana Landing on Mission Bay. It's your one-stop shop for everything you need to go fishing. A complete saltwater tackle shop, the full deli, snacks, beverages, ice, boating supplies, everything you need and for the... Uh, for your time on the freshwater, all the tackle you need, visit East County Bait and Tackle. And they have their new shop in Lemon Grove, too, Lemon Grove Bait and Tackle. All stores are fully stocked with the uh, products you know and and all the uh, information you need for a successful time on the water. Dana Landing is right next to the launch ramp, right across from Hub SeaWorld right there, right? <laughs> yep, drop off your sea bass head when you're there, too. There it is, right there. Johnny or uh, Steve will take them from you. I'm sure Steve will be stoked. Uh, right across from SeaWorld right there on Mission Bay. And ECBT is at the end of the 67 freeway at Maple View and Lakeside. And Lemon Grove Bait and Tackles on Broadway and Lemon Grove. For all this information, check DanaLanding.com. I can almost guarantee Mike's walked across the street and got an Alexa sandwich or two in his day at the uh, at the deli there at Dana Landing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Trying to cut back on the carbs, though, so it's not hard to get sandwich. But, uh, yeah. Hey, well, we're going to find out what's going on down south and talk to the man, Richard Castaneda, standing oh. by. Buenos dias, Cass. Yes, man. Hey, buenos dias, Ricky, Corey. Hope you boys are doing well. Everything's great, buddy. Hey, that's great. Hey, the <laughs> guy... 400, uh, 400 gram knife jig. You know, it's almost a pound. Right? <laughs> Jigging up and down. My God. That's a lot of weight. <laughs> it, it's a lot of weight until there's a 130 pounder attached to it. And then that weight just seems to magically go away. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? <laughs> Not a problem whatsoever. But You got uh, it, buddy. Anyway, uh, we'll start off with Loretto. I just had some clients get back. Uh, Bo uh, Hinky who was down there with this group and, uh, Reported the uh, Dorado fishing was kind of slow, even though they get, get, did get some nice bulls and and some of the smaller ones. But he said this week kind of it was kind of slow. Um, but he had uh, looked like probably a 45, 50 pound uh, uh, Dorado that he had sent me a picture of. And uh, plus they were also getting some some of the bottom fish there, the baqueta, and uh, he said lots of skipjack uh, being caught there in that area there. But uh, so it's kind of a slow week, and basically it kind of seemed like it may have been a slow week all the way down to the very tip of Baja. Good reports I got from Bob Lewis there, uh, Playita Bob from uh, La Playita. He um, indicated that uh, this week seemed to be really slow, that uh, uh, Dorado bite had slowed. Uh, basically no no tuna except for the boats that are getting out uh, 35, 40 miles and finding the porpoise. They are finding the tuna there. Uh, some quality fish, you know, 40, 50 pound fish, but, uh, it just, just happened to be one of those weeks, uh, that it's really slowed down quite a bit. And, uh, but you know, that's fishing can't be good all the time, but, uh, even though we wish it would, but, uh, anyway, that's the report for this week. Um, uh, Corey, I just want to let you know to our listeners that, uh, we've got our El Salto trip January 26 to 30. Anybody who wants to join us and for the probably one of the top bass lakes in the world uh, for largemouth bass, um, it's going to be a, a great trip as usual. You know, it's been known. I don't remember. I think the year before last, we we had close to a couple of boats with 200 fish per day. So there's a lot, a lot of bass in that lake, and uh, we always seem to hit it just about right. So anybody who wants to join us, uh, join Corey and I trip. Give me a call at 800-593-6510. Or you can check us out on the web at www.castewards.com. And I'll talk to you boys next Saturday. Yeah, good times for sure. And that uh, El Salto you're talking about, it's just, it's in a cycle that is at its prime. Like it, it was down for a number of years, Cass, and for three, four, going on four years, seasons, it's been high and a lot of water and the spawn's been good. And there's a lot of mean. Like four to six pounders just waiting. Man. A lot of hungry ones. Right? That's I how can't we like wait. Them. January 21. I can't wait. 20, yeah, 26. January 26. 26 through okay. 30. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Cass, great report as always, buddy. Appreciate you taking care of us with what's going on in the Baja and more, and we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good, boy. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Cass, man. Well, let's talk to another guy that I know loves uh, loves him some El Salto, and that's our good buddy, Captain Frank Lepresi. He's on the line. Hi, Frank. Good morning, Frank. Hey, good morning, Rick. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. I know your ears must have been burning a little bit here in a little uh, El Salto talk. 
I heard that. I just heard that. <laughs> and I might also add that uh, we have, uh, with our guys at Fisherman's Landing, uh, we have March 10th, April 10th, and May 10th, four and a half days of fishing. So if anybody wants to go on any of those trips, all they uh, got to do is contact Rick over at Fisherman's or contact me at our office. But I also want the main reason why I called Rick was to let everybody know that the Royal Polaris schedule for 2024 will be up by noon today. Oh, oh big wow. news. Excellent. And the Supreme and the Shogun will be up by noon on Monday. Okay. Oh, wow. That's a, and that's a big deal. You know, we, we've talked, Frank, every time you're on the show, and, you know, we, we get it weekly that, you know, guys really want to go fishing with you and Roy. Guys really want to go fishing with Aliar. Guys really want to go fishing with Renee. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy sometimes to get on those trips. And this is, this is it. You know, your opportunity of the new schedule coming out is happening right now. Frank, that's awesome news. Right. Right. Okay. Well. I'm sure that I hope it works out for everybody. Uh, there are, you know, there's a lot of charters, that's for sure. Um, the office will not be open today or Sunday, but they can book online. And then obviously we'll, the office will be open at uh, 8 o'clock Monday morning. I'm not going to be here because I'm going to be on the RP with John Ireland. <laughs> oh, what a cool trip. Now, are you are you driving this trip or are you going as Frank no, the Fisherman? No. Oh, boy, I'm going to try to catch a fish. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Super cool. Well, we're excited to hear about how you do uh, with uh, with John, getting John on some fish. It's uh, impressive you got him off of a cruiser and, uh, and onto the Royal Polaris, Frank. I think it's his first time ever. So, <laughs> All right, you guys, take care. Talk Frank, great later. news. Appreciate well, it. Again, Royal Polaris schedule coming out today at noon, Supreme and Shogun Monday at noon. Correct. Awesome. And book a web. I think that was a really hot tip of being able to book straight on the website. You know, if you want to get your spot, that's it. Frank, great job. Appreciate it. Have a great time on the RP and uh, maybe have Roy give us a call uh, next weekend. Let us know how the trip went. It'll be Jonathan. Okay. All All right. right. Take care. Bye bye. Great job, Frank. Appreciate that very much. All right. Hey, we're going to be right back and let's talk a cup more from uh, Mike Shane and the Hub SeaWorld Research Institute. When we return on the Let's Talk a Cup app, the Mightier 1090 ESPN Radio. Offshore fishing is on. Hi, this is Doug Kern from Fisherman's Landing Tackle, the saltwater tackle professionals. For bluefin, tuna, and yellowtail, nothing beats the Shimano Talica, the pinnacle of lever drag two-speed reels. Shimano Speedmaster 2 is also an extremely durable, high-performance lever drag reel for the more budget-minded angler. Both the Talica and Speedmaster 2 feature Shimano's Hagani body to prevent misalignment of moving parts under the heaviest of loads. For all your Shimano, visit us at Fisherman's Landing Tackle at Fisherman's Landing in San Diego. This is Captain Art Taylor from Searcher Sport Fishing. Your hook is one of the most important links to catching fish. And at Searcher Sport Fishing, we use and recommend Gamagatsu hooks. The Gamagatsu Nautilus hook is best for tuna. And now with a variety of sizes all the way down to size 4, Gamagatsu hooks are the ones to use. It's important to be prepared with the right tackle when you come aboard Searcher, so that should include Gamagatsu hooks. Season long range fishermen know that the Red Rooster 3 is the finest fishing vessels in terms of technology, design, speed, comfort, and safety. This 105 foot sport fishing yacht meets every demand for comfort while delivering an unforgettable fishing vacation. Captain Andy Kate and crew are experienced, friendly, and sincere in their desire to help you have the trip of a lifetime. Book a trip on the Red Rooster 3 and you'll be back. Trips go fast. So check redrooster3.com or call Lee Palm Sport Fisheries at 619 224 3857. It's time for the Power Pro 30 Second Seminar. I like catching big fish and I like smaller reels too. How do I make sure that I have the capacity to land the big one? I fill my reels with Power Pro Max Quattro. It's 25% thinner than standard Power Pro, so you get more line on that small reel. Power Pro has a complete series of highly effective lines, including the brand new Power Pro Depth Hunter Offshore with different colors every hundred feet. Perfect for flatfall fishing. Want to learn more? Check PowerPro.com. 
In San Diego, the future belongs to everyone. So Ford engineered the truck of the future for everyone. The Ford F-150, available with a pro-power onboard generator. What a great addition for anglers. There's also a variety of cab configurations for whatever you need to haul. The truck of the future isn't created for just a few. It's created for us who love the ocean and the outdoor life. Ford F-150. Test drive one at your local San Diego County Ford dealer today. They'll be glad to hook you up. Welcome! Hey, welcome back to Let's Talk Hook Up and uh, super cool show show having Mike Shane in here from the Hub SeaWorld Research Institute. And we're giving away a couple tickets, Rick, uh, to a gala happening September 21st. Yeah, a couple of really cool events going on at uh, at, at Hubs and, and the SeaWorld Park. Uh, you know, the one uh, preceding you guys is the big, uh, you know, honoree dinner of Bill Shedd. Uh, CCA has uh, honored uh, Bill Shedd uh, with the uh, Anthony Shea Conservation Award, which, which is really CCA's highest award. And I mean, there is not a single person who's more deserving of a conservation award, in my opinion, than than Bill Shedd. And you know, we talk about AFTCO's contributions all the time, but they really, <clears throat> they really don't. They really talk the talk in addition to walking the walk. You know, they, those guys. It's one thing to be involved, but they are involved financially with their time, with their efforts, with their people. They just. There's nobody that's more deserving of con- of a conservation award, in my opinion, than than Bill. Yeah, and Bill has been, you know, he's he's a chair of our board, <clears throat> board for our organization, has been so for a number of years, and and has helped to support the institute when we were going through some even some challenging times with some extra funding, et cetera, to keep us going. But obviously, with with the uh, foresight of his father, you know, he's continued on in, in support of the organization to, you know, make sure the legacy continues and, and we keep moving forward. So he's, you know, he's great. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, what he's doing, I know he's also being inducted to the IGFA Hall of Fame this year as well. And the other thing uh, just to mention about, and we can talk about more of this later, but when you don't drop your heads off, especially for the rec- uh, private recreational fishermen, AFCO is giving away a $25 gift certificate to you know one per angler uh, for the year but between now and the end of uh august so i didn't realize that was a a thing for this year i knew i knew that was before and i thought that was such a cool idea so 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 run that again if you if you drop off a head at one of the approved facilities you're going to get an aftco 25 dollars gift certificate to spend on their website for private records that turns in you know any private person that turns it in but we need your obviously your contact information and particularly an email so when they drop off their heads between now and the end of August. Um, I will provide that information to Bill, and Bill will get make sure they get the you know email certificate for. Purchases. That is Man, so cool. Like That's just, so cool. Just another way to AFCO. Like yeah. their pledge, Rick, is what ten <clears throat> percent, like minimal. Minimum of that they yeah. give back. And, and so and, how do we? How do we, Rick? How do we that August third uh, deal at SeaWorld mm-hmm. for for honoring such a gentleman? How how do we? Get just jump on the CCA one. website. It's super easy. Uh, CCA, uh, the, the main, you know, so so this is not a um, CCA. Like one of the reasons it works so well is there's the CCA National, um, which you know kind of encompasses everybody, uh, in, including uh, in Washington, and you know, and and having people speak on our behalf politically. And then CCA National is supported by the states, and then the states broken down into chapters. And you know, there's chapters like. San Diego and Orange County and South Los Angeles and Los Angeles and Inland Empire and all, yeah. all the way up and down the coast. Um, so this is a this is like the main CCA event. Um, you know the entire the entire organization honoring uh, honoring Bill there. And but yeah, you just jump on the CCA website. You'll see right away up on the on the front page. Um, you know where to where to get tickets to go to the event. And, I'm so bummed to not be going right August third, but. Super stoked to be going with Pete. I oh, bet you uh, are, yeah. <laughs> to Queen, Queen Charlotte Safari, yeah. right? Yeah, it's gonna be fun. And, and you know, you mentioned at the very beginning of the show, Mike, that that's been, you know, that's kind of like that was started with uh, with Milt Shed. That uh, you know, their philosophy has always been if we're gonna make money from something, that we need to give back to it. And and you kind of not glossed over it, but it's something that that's very worth mentioning. That Hubs was started, you know, so Milt Shed. Uh, Bill's father was one of the founder of SeaWorld, and before the SeaWorld Park even opened its doors, 
Hubs was was already running, and Hubs is funded from the park, and n- them knowing that hey, if we're going to make money on marine life, we're going to give back to it, and it's it's been that way since the you know since before the doors opened. Yeah, I mean it's it's been great to have that and have that ability, and, and even the facility that we're in right now, our headquarters, which is our Mission Bay, is a facility that's still owned by SeaWorld, or at least get you know they lease it from the city for as, as well the land of the park. But um, and we you know arranged a you know a long term dollar year type of contract, and so they when Anheuser Busch that was back when Anheuser Busch owned SeaWorld gave us that which used to be the uh, old Atlantis restaurant for those that are yes. old enough <laughs> like <laughs> myself can remember. Can remember. Yeah, yeah. I remember going there when I was yeah. in high school and, was and having dinner, but. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so that that is now our headquarters, and, and they gave us money, Anheuser Busch, to renovate that. But uh, again, to continue on with this, you know, close relationship that we do have with SeaWorld, even though we're not uh, part of SeaWorld, uh, we're not their employees. You know, we have the name incorporated because of our founding fathers um, for that. But we are a separate 501c3 organization. They do help support us, like obviously with that facility. Um, they give us a, a, some some a small contribution every year to help support our operations. A lot of our funding, though, comes from outside grants and contracts okay. um, as, as well. We need to continue to do that as a nonprofit. And obviously, funders help support various programs and, and the organization as well, too, private donors that uh, we go out and, you know, it's like any nonprofit trying to, you know, knock on doors and sure. know about us and hopefully trying to get better at, at making people more aware in San Diego of, of our organization. And, and, you know, I've been told by, you know, even years ago by SDG&E executives like, who are you guys? You guys right. are like the best kept secret in <laughs> yeah, San Diego. Yeah, totally. So yeah. We're trying to you know improve on those and 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 get out there and get the large corporate sponsorships as well for organizations. So. That's awesome. Pretty neat. I I have a question, a personal question. I know like five to ten years ago, Ken Frankie on the Outer Limits was catching the cow cod. For was that also through what you're doing? Yeah. So we were. Yeah. So yeah, we kind of got okay. off on there. Yeah. We yeah. didn't even talk about the yellowtail, but yeah, yeah. there's some time ago we were doing ro- studies on rockfish, trying to understand. Uh, there, can we culture them? How how that works? And so we w- went out on the outer limits for a number of trips to try to catch cow cod, and uh, that presents some unique challenges in the sense of um, one, these fish have internal fertilization different than a sea bass that's uh, or a halibut or a yellowtail, which are broadcast spawners. So something so they're actually live bears. The females spit out little babies ready to go. Live So yes, is yes, that the right? That's correct. Yeah, and so. Um, but also they are caught at deep waters, and, so, and they have swim bladders. And as people know, that fish sea bass, I mean, the same thing applies with rockfish. We're catching them down 300 feet. You know, you've got to bring them up slowly. Still can't, they still can't off-gas or get rid of the air. air. So their swim bladders obviously in, inflate due to the re- reducing pressure as they come up from the depths. And so we developed uh, and implemented uh, pressure chambers for our fish. So we would go out there, catch them, bring them up there, and try to bring them up slow, you know, from 300 feet, maybe 15, not faster than 15 minutes, and then get them into these pressure chambers and recompress them right away, get them back down to depth, and then... Obviously, when we came back into shore, get them on or on land, and so we had these chambers that were portable. They could keep the pressure in there. The challenge is kept keeping keep pressure, but you also want fresh water and oxygen yeah, circulating sure. through that. So what a challenge! Um, so we had all that designed out, and we were able to, after about a you know slowly over a week's time, um, get them to pressure at you know sea level, and they were fine after that. And then we put them into our tanks trying to hopefully get them to do their thing in the tanks. And we use some of the old aquariums that were in, in the uh, Atlantis restaurant that have it looked similar to their habitat in the wild. They have huge rocks in them, and we could control the temperature, keep it cool. It was dark. Uh, but we just never, fortunately, we tried that. And, and uh, cow cod, we had some other uh, rockfish, picacho were in there and some other things, and just weren't successful after a number of years trying to get that. So we then ended up ending that ending that program. Yellowtail, I mean, we're still working on yellowtail. That's another one that we talk, hit on earlier. But yellowtail, um, we've been working on that for a number of years in, in part because it's a popular food fish. And so when you get sushi, hamachi mm-hmm. around the world, it all comes from cultured yellowtail. Um, there's there's wild capture fisheries for it, but none of that's used for the for the 
uh, sashimi. sashimi market. Yes, yeah. yeah. Right. So, so we're pr- working on that, and 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 uh, some of your viewers may know is we we're we're in the process of having working through a federal permits to maybe be the first organization in this country to do what's called offshore aquaculture. So yellowtail would be the model for that, where we could in our hatchery, you know, get them to spawn in captivity, very similar to white sea bass. You know, mm-hmm. we can you know we can control the temperature, they spawn when the conditions are right. They're broadcast spawners. The eggs float out of the tank. It's all stuff that's in your wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. And then you grow those up, get them the same size, just like the white sea bass grow out pens, and then stock them out in the pens offshore. Get, you know, within hopefully 18 months, less than two years, get those fish to a marketable size, and then bring them back in uh, to the market to, you know, compete with like foreign imports. I mean, because we do import. 91% 91% of the seafood that we consume in this country. And scary and, because you really don't know what they've been fed in these, I, I mean, yeah. beyond third world countries, right? Yeah, I mean, correct. I mean, there there are already in, in place, you know, regulations and things like that, that what we can use and can't use to, to feed them. And there uh, things are already there. We, you know, we don't need to create new legislation or new, uh, you know, rules for mm-hmm. this it's already there and the same thing with even with our white sea bass i mean there's certain things we can do and use i mean they're considered food fish so there's we're not throwing a bunch of chemicals at them or hormones or anything like that we just this, those aren't acceptable to the F- fda and so if fish gets sick you know you, it, it, you, you have very little you can use for food fish but you know so the idea is is not to you know yeah, don't practice, not, not yeah, to go don't, that bad yeah, exactly yes. you know control what you're stocking in these pens, the densities and the fish, the water quality and the health and the fee, you know, so it's very being proactive on the husbandry side to take care of these. And it truly would be done no better way than having the United States or, you know, California in this case, like allowing us to do that, right? I mean, that would be the healthiest way for a consumer to purchase yeah, so we would yeah we would do this actually in federal waters, so it's outside state waters. Okay. So federal waters, um, California already has unfortunately legislation that makes it challenging to uh, if almost impossible to do fish in state waters. No, no uh, surprise. Yeah, so we, we would <laughs> we would be working in federal waters, and this is the model kind of around the United States, trying to work in. There's a, a proposal I think for Florida to try to do a similar mm-hmm. grow out in a, in a different ocean style pen, but we, no, we would do this off, off of Southern California. I'm not sure if it's going to happen off San Diego or potentially Long Beach area, but, you know, there's always multiple users out there. So the challenge is, you know, we've got San Diego, huge military presence. So almost every millimeter out there in the ocean (laughs) off San Diego (laughs) is utilized utilized by the military in particular. And and so they've got these designated areas. And so we have to work with them, even figure out what little footprint that we could get out there that wouldn't interfere with their operations. So, you know, we've got a couple of ideas, you know, going places that we're going out there. So that's that's what we're trying to do with, with Yellowtail. And, and, yeah, the, the food, the, the quality, and, I mean, yeah, we have regulations, like I say, on what we can feed them, what we can do, and, and where, yeah, that's not the same. And, and not only that, it's it's the, the carbon footprint. I mean, how much fuel are you burning to get a, a fish halfway around the world? You sure. know, they may have more flight miles on it than, than we have ourselves, I you know, just, traveling. You know, kind of so. crazy. Any, anything yeah. that reduces our dependency on a foreign brought in yeah. thing is a good thing. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm excited and, and hope that it hope that it continues the good path and you guys are able to get it through. Hey, we had a great text come through. It said, good morning, guys. What a great show. My question is from Mike. Mike, I frequently catch orange mouth Corvina in San Diego Bay. Can you explain what some of the differences are between these and the white sea bass also does hubs do any type of study on corvina since they seem to be such a similar fish um any ideas on their population growth as compared to sea bass that's all from ralph and minifee ah, cool yeah so orange mouth corvina um that is it's been been coming up more i mean when i was sampling out there so i've been out in the water for 30 years i mean my background's more as a fisheries a research scientist out on the water but we'd see, you know, orange mouth corvina, you know, in San Diego Bay, in Mission Bay. I mean, they're all over the place now in certain places. So the difference is with that, I mean, it's in the same family as sea bass. It's a cyanid croaker. Um, and croakers worldwide are popular food fish, and I'm, I'm, guys should target them and, and yeah. if they're going to eat them. I mean, but so the difference is pr- primarily when you look at it, it looks very similar to a juvenile sea bass in that guards, but when you catch them. But in the roof of the mouth, one of the more dead giveaways is the two fangs or, or vomer and you know, the teeth that are up in there that sit there. So you just open it up and look and see. I mean, the other, other thing is they don't have, like, sea bass will have a ridge on their belly that um, is, is pronounced. And he, these guys oh, don't, don't have that. that. Yeah, okay. yeah. 
And uh, like so, a, so orange mouth or short fin. He may be referring to also sorry to short fin corvina mm-hmm. too. I haven't seen. I'm trying to think of the orange orange, and maybe that's what he's confusing with because I don't know if we really truly have orange mouth corvina. Never in, never in seen here, one or heard of short, one. Short fin corvina yeah. is most likely what it is. Right. And right. the problem is the short fin corvina yeah. do have an orange tint to the to their mouth. They you know do, which yeah. which you you know. People know the name Orange Mouth Corvina, which, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the fish that would catch in salt and sea. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. we know that that name exists, and you catch a short fin, and, well, it's got an orange mouth and fang. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the short and why it's called short fin is the pectoral fin uh, on it doesn't extend past the pelvic fin. So the oh. pelvic fins are the ones on the stomach, and obviously when you look at a sea bass, it, it goes the, their pectoral fins go beyond the, the, the pelvic fins. And and really their, their compressed, like, look on a Corvina is compressed from side to side where a sea Sea bass, white sea bass is more of like a yellowfin croaker, like triangulated and mm. larger at the bottom too. And I mean, it's pretty yeah. easy to tell right out of the gate. Yeah, I, I remember years ago again educating even the fishing game wardens uh, that were working on the docks when I was on the docks to say, hey, here's what, because they don't really see that. I mean, you can look in a book and see a diagram of it or whatever, but to really see one sure. in person. So I would ask them, say, hey, what do you? As they're walking by, hey, what do you think this is? And uh, you know, they'll go see that, and I say, no. And so I had to educate them. So they were very thankful in that. And because yeah, I don't, I, I don't think there's any regulations as far as I know on the short fin corvina with regards to the size of mm-hmm. that of that fish. I, I know there's a general number of fish you can keep in a day, but. Um, but yeah, so they're they're definitely seem to increase in numbers, and I even remember even bonefish in in, um, in San, Diego San Diego Bay, Bay increasing. I mean, there was times where I would catch more bonefish than there's than a most lot of them, them in yeah, the back yeah. bay. So yeah, so it's been popular. So. Do, you, do you think that those come via larvae, via egg? Like how how does that fish from a southern region yeah. make it this far? So we think in, during these type of of warm water years, um, like we're having right yeah. now potentially. Um, that they move up and then they get confined potentially in these bays, which are naturally warmer than the open ocean. So you know, you've seen, you know, I've seen bonefish here, San Diego Bay, Mission Bay, Newport. and even Newport, yes, yeah. all the way up the, up the coast. And so they they're, they're here, and once they sort of they probably you know stay inside these bays and continue to reproduce. Bonefish are kind of unique and that they have what's called leptocephalus larvae. So, like, for a year, they have, they're just like these little worm-looking things, you know, to, to, as fish. I mean, our fish in a year look like a sea bass and they're growing up, you know. But, but the bonefish. Yeah, challenge. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's, that's a, a trip. Really a challenge, even for culture. I mean, there are, there's certainly been interest across this country to do culture with bonefish. I'm sure, yeah. People, especially in Florida. So they've been working on it down there. It's just it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge to in, in, in culture to try to, Support that leptocephalus larvae for a year. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome info. Such, I love this show, Mike. Oh, so such, much fun having you here. Such great information. Listen, if you want to join us, one open line right now, 213-432-1090. It's all yours. And we're going to be taking that call. Text some more. We've got fish reports coming when we return on the Let's Talk a Kebab, the Mightier 1090 ESPN Radio. Here's John Ireland for Rancho Leonero. Rancho Leonero was awarded the Certificate of Excellence from TripAdvisor for four straight years. Especially interesting, most hotels are just hotels, and most people stay in the hotel and go do their activities elsewhere. Rancho Leonero, of course, provides fishing, diving, all activities, all meals, your whole vacation. So the fact that we're so highly rated, we're very proud of it. From picking you up at the airport to dropping you off, literally everything is a turnkey from there. We make it as easy as we can for you at the ranch from your meals to whether you're going to go fishing or diving or just hang out by the pool when you're coming to ranch line Air, you are coming to john ireland's home i guarantee the best fishing vacation experience in all of baja it's unique there's nowhere that i could think of to get the same experience that you get at ranch line Air. our new reservation phone number is 800-646-2252 baja and ranch it's really unique it is we're very proud of it Want to take your catch from fresh to superior grade? This is Robbie Gant from AFCO. We developed the tools for the EKGMA process. Circuit Breaker is specially designed to disable the full length of the fish's spinal cord. The memory-resistant wire of AFCO Circuit Breaker will not bend or kink, even after repeated use. Take your fish care to the next level with Circuit Breaker by AFCO. Available at a dealer near you or check out AFCO.com. Like Robbie said, take your fish care to the next level with Circuit Breaker by AFCO. Check AFCO.com or your favorite tackle retailer. 
This is Captain Brandon Nelson from Lucky Bee Sport Fishing. Our dynamic fishery here on the West Coast is home to some of the most iconic game fish that swim the salty world. We demand tools designed to perform flawlessly and deliver the upper hand in any situation. That's why I use and recommend the all-new G. Loomis IMX Pro Offshore Series of Rods. It's a full lineup of purpose-built 20- to 80-pound class rods. I have been fortunate enough to be working with G. Loomis on the IMX Pro for some time to help develop the actions we need here on the West Coast and they nailed it. The G. Loomis multi-taper design technology adds material where the blank is likely to fail and subtracts material where it won't. A C guide train and Fuji reel seat complement a battle on grip that offers extreme fatigue fighting comfort. They have been helping my passengers on Lucky Bee Sport Fishing land some amazing fish and now they are ready for you. The new G. Loomis IMX Pro Offshore Rod Series at your local Shimano or G. Loomis dealer. When it comes to fishing rods for saltwater, there's just one name you need to know, Calstar. Take for example the Graphiter Series. It's a true graphite and fiberglass composite rod, the finest it's ever been built. And for anglers seeking traditional performance, durability, and quality at an affordable price, the Calstar West Coast Series of Rods and Blanks are the ones for you. Their master craftsmen bring decades of rod building experience to every rod they make. So if you want your fishing rods to be truly state-of-the-art, I always recommend Calstar at fine tackle stores everywhere. This is Captain Tim Ekstrom from the Long Range Vessel Royal Star. With my partners Randy Toussaint and Brian Sims, we have set the bar for the Long Range Fishing Experience. Spring 8-day, summer 5-day, or a fly-down, fly-back, 11-day winter trip, we deliver the highest quality Long Range Voyage you will find. From our premium RSW fish storage to our top-of-the-line chefs and crew, Royal Star distinguishes itself from all others. Want to grab a spot on the Royal Star? Check us out at royalstarsportfishing.com or call Tracy at 619-224-4764. 